Suicide. It's a word that's not spoken about enough. It's a word that's not said enough. Personally to me, I think it should be spoke and said every day. In Northern Ireland, 307 people were registered dead, cause of death, suicide. That was in 2018. It's not good enough. I personally think we need to be talking about this more openly. Suicide has affected me personally. I'm Dylan McKee. This is my story. Suicide and me. I think it was just a normal old day, out and about, messing about, floating out in the cars, driving about, doing normal things. So I think I had him out during the afternoon, the dog, and floating about, having a laugh. Little did I know that what was ahead of me that day, to be fair, I think it was in high, a good, good sort of high mood. So I was... Um, I've seen a few things on social media that brought me down a bit, so I did, and sort of annoyed me to the point where I just clicked, something clicked in my head to saying, right, this needs to happen. Like, mind you, I had had a plan for a while, but I didn't know when, if you get me. I didn't know when it was going to happen. I just had this planned. If this happens, this is how it's going to go out. This is how it's going to play. I got into the house about seven because I knew what time I'd get in. And I got into the house and I was all right, but it was just that initial, why? Why am I feeling like this? Why me? As such. Um, and I got into the house and I'd done the normal thing everyone does. Scroll through socials before you go to bed and... There was something on socials that tipped me. Like people don't people underestimate how powerful social media is. Like I was all, think of think of yourself on top of a cliff and all you need is that one thing to kick you and that's you done. Um but I think it was within what four or five days of being home from the cruise ship that I felt Nah, it's, nothing's right. There's just something not right in this situation that's making me not want to be here. Was it social media posts or just... No, it was a loss. It was a loss of friends. Right. It was a loss of people that I counted on. People that I spent nearly all day, every day with. Um, and I just... You don't understand... Like, some people won't understand. Like, you've had loads of friends. You've had this really tight knit friend group you've done loads of stuff with yeah. you've went and seen concerts you've went on day trips you've went and done these things and then one day someone just stops so they do and you've lost everything you feel like you've lost everything really I hadn't I still have my family but your friends are the ones that get you through things yeah. understand you I'd lost all my friends so I'd felt really trapped and really lonely and I'd felt like that for the guts of about a month. All of this was just building and building and building and building. So it was and I just tipped and that's the night I lifted the the bag out of my room that I had stored everything in and went. Went to one of my one of my favourite places. I go to and I have been going to for a long time and it's one of these places where you have that freedom where you just sit there and you just reflect on things and by the time you're finished by the time not even by the time you're finished but by the time you're halfway through what you wanted to achieve from that your worries are gone Everyone's got that sacred place. I have got that. The drive there was very blurry for me because there, I don't even one one thing on my mind. 
this is going to be the last time I drive my car. This is going to be the last time I drive this road. And thankfully, it wasn't. But yeah, that night, got to got to my destination. I sent a text message to the mum of my godkids to tell her to give them a kiss from me and tell them that I loved them. And I sent a text message to my brother to say that, to give Theo a kiss from me and to tell him I loved him and then turn my phone off. My happy place, if it had been up to me that night, my happy place would have been my happy place where I wanted to be, I wanted to stay, I wanted to finish things. As you can hear, my record of events is very much basic. And I want to start the journey and build that puzzle with some help from the people that were there and gather their version of events. I wanted to capture in their words how it affected them and how they individually dealt with what happened. Because everyone has a different angle. Not only did my suicide attempt affect me, automatically it affects the people around me. And this is what we're about to learn. Every journey, it has a beginning. This is mine, home. I knew you weren't right, Dylan. And you texted me that message on the 17th of November to tell me that you loved me after you'd got abusive messages sent to you. And then that message came through to my phone. I thought, hold on, wait, there's something not right with him. They say you know your own children. Well, I certainly know mine. So I got on to Daniel, and Daniel was like, Mom, we'll be fine. Then a message came through from Sophie, and she received something similar to what I received, to tell the, the kids that you loved them very much the next day. So I phoned Daniel back, and I said to him, Daniel, you're going to have to go and see if you can find your brother. He's not answering his phone, and I know there's something not right. But Daniel being Daniel, and you being you, what you normally are, he was like, Mom, Dylan will be fine. But no, I wasn't settling for that. So I phoned your dad, tried to get him, got the hold of him. His words were, well, if he turns up here, I'll let you know. If he's not going to turn up there, I need you to go and look for him. But he, he just kept saying, if he turns up, I'll let you know. So that was OK. Phoned Daniel back, told Daniel, and Daniel says, Mom, it's okay. Sophie's been on with Lauren. We, we are going to go um, out and look for him. So I had Matthew texting me. I had Lauren, as in Lauren Ross. They were all out. Um, Lauren's mum and dad were out. It was horrendous being stuck thousands of miles away. No, one of my boys were missing and I couldn't go and help. When you were on the phone um, and you were in Benadorm, you obviously just wanted to be here to help, find. Um, when you found out what was going on, what was going on in your head? Well, we went back to the hotel room, me, your auntie Jude and Uncle Darren, and Lauren Ross phoned me and she says to me, Amanda, he's been found. He's overdosed. There was no console in me whatsoever. Your Auntie Jude and Uncle Darren tried their best. He was online trying to get flights to get us home. But we couldn't get home. It was the end of the season in Benidorm. And all the flights were full. Even to go from Benidorm to England to Belfast, we still couldn't do it. So I had to sit my ground and rely on everybody else to get you better. Um, Lauren then phoned and said that the police had found you and they were on their way to the Ulster with you. I haven't been able to get in touch with Matthew Yates at this time, but then he phoned me in a panic saying he had found your car at the cemetery in Corridor. And I had said to him, listen, he has been found, he is on his way to the Ulster. So they wanted to head up and I said, no, go back to my house, get his spare key 
and bring his car home. So that's what that's what they did. Um, I was getting a lot of text messages from various people regarding it all, but in my own head, there's things that I have seen over the past months and years that yes, I can see various things that I feel would affected you, that has affected you mentally. And everybody here thinks you're the life and the soul of the party and you are Dylan, without a matter of a doubt. But you have had your issues and you have had your problems. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been easy that, that the, all those bullying messages that you sent me that night before you sent me that message. I know, we know the person who was behind that, but we have no proof of that. But one day we will, we'll find out who it was. Um, but I had to set my ground in Benidorm and just speak to you over the phone um, the following day, the, that evening it was, and that seemed like weeks to speak to you. Um, your brother was amazing. He never left your side. He was straight down the next morning and stayed with you to like at home. Um, I just, I just wish that you could have spoke to somebody before you did yeah. what you did. Regarding, well, like I mean, with with the mental health side of things, it's it's easy for someone to say you can speak to someone this that and the other, but see, once you've got something planned out in your head, you've got this is your end result. This is what I, what I was hoping to achieve. Nothing was going to get in the way of that. Um, and like, I don't have any regrets of that night because it's taught me. It's taught me a few things. Um, but with that also, I've seen how close-knit our family can be in those sort of times, which is something that I never thought I would ever have seen. Um, when you came home, uh, when you touched down in Belfast, what was going what was going through your head? I wanted my luggage, I wanted out of that airport and I wanted down to Donegaday as fast as I could get down. Obviously with uh, doctors saying that I wasn't to be left alone until I seen a mental health specialist, um, with everyone that was rallying around and doing things, I want from your perspective the the week or so after it's all happened, what was I like as a person that week after? You were quiet. You were very subdued. You didn't want to be bothered. And all I wanted to do was help you. And you kept not pushing me away, but I couldn't understand why you wouldn't let me in to help you. I didn't leave your side. I took time off work to be at home with you. I went with you to hospital appointments, to counselling appointments. Okay, I couldn't go in with you, but I was there for you. Yeah. Um, I just I just wanted to make it all better for you, but I couldn't. Yeah. Um, well, what was going through my head is, I, it's it still feel, felt weird for me. It still felt that... I still felt that I didn't want to be here. I still felt that there was things going on in my head that was making me think, why did I not just take more tablets that night? Um, but again, it's, it's taught me a lot from that night. Um, and it's taught me that things are meant to happen for a reason. Um, Someone's told me that that week that I was on the recovery process, I was much of a shell of a person, a shell of me, than than the actual me. Um, yeah, that, that, that's about right. I didn't shower. <laughs> no, shower for a week. we couldn't get you to do anything. We couldn't get you out of bed. You were in bed all day, every day, apart from going to the hospital or the, cons the counselling sessions. Uh -huh and it was being reassessed for medication and stuff like that there. Um, looking back on it now, it was, in my eyes, a scary week. Not for me, but for the people around me, people watching me. 
Um, like it took me what two weeks to see the God Kids. It took me a week to see Fail. So it did. Just nothing seemed right in my head. Um, as a mum, and any other mums that are watching this, would you have any sort of advice for other mums? Because yes, there was me, and I was not mentally right at the stage and I was flying off the handle with you I was slamming doors back at you because I just didn't feel there was nothing in my head to stop me from doing anything I didn't want to be here so I didn't um, and I, I briefly remember putting a leaflet on the table and telling you to read that um, and then you told me that you'd actually phoned someone to get a bit of an insight to get some help just so you could help me yeah, well, at the end of the day, I would have done anything that I had to do to help you in any way, shape or form. So, yeah, I did speak to someone and their advice to me was to take each day as it comes and always be there, not to be flying off the handle with you, not to expect you to just jump and do things and to let you come round in your own time and come and talk to me when you felt ready to. That was very, very difficult because you're the type of person that can come and talk to me about absolutely anything in this world. And to not be able to come and talk to me about how you were feeling was very, very hard. Mm -hmm. But I took their advice and in the end you did come and talk to me. Yeah. Um, I never thought we could get any closer than what we were. The relationship I have with you and your brothers is fantastic and you know that, everybody knows that. But you did, you came and you spoke to me and now I can help you to the best I possibly can. And you still have your down days. I know you still have your down oh, yeah. days. Oh, yeah. Last week I knew you had your down days. That's why I was always checking up, you okay? As I do. <laughs> but that's just that's just the mummy coming out in me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, back to the, any advice for mums or dads out there that you could give to them, you've experienced this situation, maybe they're going through it or maybe they will go through it at some stage, what would you say to them? As much as it is very hard. Yeah, um, listen to what your kids have to say, whether they're 10, 14, 18, 20, whatever age, they'll always be your kids. So just, just be there for them, listen to them, if you notice any changes in their activities, their ways, whatever, take note of it and just keep keep a close eye. But don't keep saying to them, "You all right? What's wrong? Do you need anything?" You know, observe observe from the outside, and then approach as the time goes on is the best way to do it. Yeah, because I know from my own personal, I don't like people asking me, "Are you okay?" <clears throat> because you can't you can't ask someone who's mentally and physically suffering from a mental health issue maybe in anxiety and depression you can't ask someone are they okay because it's a stupid question because they're never okay no you you just take every day as it comes you you bite the bullet and like i mean i was on top of the world what was it last year the year before running these marathons and running this that and the other before that we only ran to the table for food um, and then I hit a brick wall and that's when things went nuts for me. Um, started dabbling in the drugs that you know of. Um, and that's, I think that's where it started going downhill for me. And I think that's where you started noticing yeah. that something wasn't right. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you noticed that what was going to happen in the months leading up to it. No. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, um, in Northern Ireland, mental health, huge issue. I don't know if you knew this, but every 40 seconds, someone in the UK takes their own life. So by the time someone's watched this interview, four, maybe five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine, people have took their own life due to mental health issues. Um, men under the age of 45, it's the biggest killer for them. Um, do you think that more can be done? to help mental health and help suicide prevention and awareness yeah definitely but i think 
I think a lot more people need to sort of try and speak out, even if they can't, they need to try, even speak to a stranger. It doesn't have to be somebody you know. You know, there's plenty of helplines out there. Just lift the phone and phone. You're not doing anything wrong. You could be saving your own life. The, the help that is out there, I know I had to wait. I don't know how long it was for my counselling appointment to come through. You got the first one, well, I suppose it was about 10 days or so. And then you got the other one, probably three, three, four weeks, the hospital one. Yeah. But we went to that one in Belfast and they were very, very good. Yeah, that was suicide prevention in the falls. Yeah. Extremely good. I even felt after that first session, I was a lot. Of, they a were lot. very good with me as well. Yeah, I spoke to you too, um, because like, as a person that suffers, you know, I'm not the only one suffering because the people in the household are suffering too, because me being this person that's the life and soul of the party and always laughing, this weird contagious laugh. If a day goes past and you don't hear that you know something's not right mm. and there is other people out there that are a lot more quieter that won't that you won't be able to pick up on as, as much no but it's all about knowing the signs and knowing when something just isn't right um but like from where i've come from to now do you see stupid question but do you see much of a difference yeah i do I do. And as I said before, I do see your down days, but now that you have got your own house, which I didn't want you doing, I wanted you to stay at home for a while, but you felt it was the right thing for you to do. So I was like, right, okay, then let's do this. So you've got your own place and you've your own space, but you always know I'm at the end of the phone for you. Yeah, yeah, that brand too. Goes without saying. <laughs> well, I think it's like the only thing for me to say now is thank you for being there. I'll always be here for you. Thank you. Give me a hug. <laughs> I've never had that sort of conversation with my mum, and now the first piece in my jigsaw building journey is placed. I've now started to see from the outside what I was like. I now understand why my brother didn't want to be interviewed. I caught up with my best friend, sort of more of a sister I've never had. She moved off to Australia for a gap year soon after my suicide attempt. Lauren's piece of the jigsaw is a big piece to me. Hey babe! Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Loving the top. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I want to, obviously you know best besides me, but I want to know on the 18th of November, what actually happened. Um, because I remember some of that night, but don't remember very much. Um, obviously mm -hmm. the first person to get a phone call from the police the first person to be told that I have been found. I want to know what was going on. Okay, so oh my heart's racing even thinking about it to be honest. Um it was just a normal day. Um I had gone to work all day as usual, working long hours, went and picked up a Chinese at the end of my shift and went to my friend Dana's house. Had a, was having a good wee night and I got a message from your mum asking if I had heard from you and actually I hadn't even realised that I hadn't. It was the first time in a very long time that we hadn't spoken uh, for the whole day and then I started getting worried and she was texting me from Benidorm and saying like have you heard from Dylan he's gone missing he texted me saying he loved me and uh, no one's heard from him no one's seen him and I went, no, but I can guarantee where he is. Where's Jeff's grave? Yeah. And just as your mum texted me the address, like where Jeff is buried, I got into my car 
but I was in such a shock that um, Dana actually had to come with me because I could, if if I had of actually gone and found you without being contacted by the police, I wouldn't have been able to do anything, and Dana would have been able to click in the action. Yeah. So Dana was in the car with me, and I just put in the maps and was leaving Bangor, um, where Jeff is buried, and got a phone call from this random number. And I answered it and it was the police officer. She was very nice, very nice, reassured me you're okay, told me that you'd taken an overdose and everything. And my first question was, is he okay? Can I ring his mum and tell her? And she said no, that you didn't want any family knowing um, where you were, what had happened, that you were going to the hospital, they were going to bring you up. And she wanted me to meet you there. So me being me, I did a quick U-turn in the road and bombed it over the Craig Antlet. Now, I was on my way to Grey Abbey from Bangor. So it was uh, Dana. (laughs) Dana was probably in a lot of shock seeing the way I was driving. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, Yeah, I got to the hospital and was walking to the entrance of A&E when the, I just saw blue lights coming and it was a police car and I automatically knew that it was you. Um, and as they pulled up to the entrance of A&E, I literally just like started walking really fast and you got out of the car and you, you, were just, you just had a blank expression on your face and you didn't really take in what was going on. Like you were completely dazed. And I literally just took you in my arms and like gave you a massive hug. And at that moment, I realized that you were going to be okay and that you had actually reached out yourself and got the help from the police because you realized that it wasn't your time to go. It was you that rang the emergency services. And for that, like, I am so grateful for because it could have been too late by the time I got there. There were so many other people out looking and no one knew exactly where the grave was. And I was like, it's it's so scary to think what could have happened. But anyway, um, I took you uh, to put your, your pin in and I rang your brother. Um, I rang Danny and I said to him that you were okay. I told him where we were and told him that um, I was the first person in the police rang. Um, at that point in time, I apologised as well. Um, I kind of felt like maybe your family were going to be annoyed that I was the first person that came to mind when you wanted help, but when you wanted the police to ring someone. I was that person, not your family. Um, and I just the whole the whole night and even for weeks after that and even still now, I even think like they they probably have some sort of spite against me for that, but at the same time they're probably grateful for me being there and being such a good friend that you do feel comfortable that you can talk to me and um be I can be that first responder for you. Um I would say probably 20 minutes maximum after I rang Danny, um, they arrived at the hospital. By that stage, you had been checked in um, at a and by the police officers. They had told me that I wasn't allowed to leave until you were leaving the hospital as well because I was the first point of contact. Um, and it was then just a waiting game. Um, after Danny and Lauren arrived, um, Sophie and her partner arrived, and then your dad and his partner arrived as well. And I'm not joking, you Dylan. The support system that was there for you that night there <laughs> there was like eight of us sitting in the waiting room of A and E for one person. <laughs> it was like something out of a movie at one point. Um. But yeah, it got to got quite late. 
I can't remember. I think it was like half one maybe in the morning when um, we were then finally allowed to go home. Um, I brought you home and I waited with you. Obviously, your mum wasn't there. So your mum had been informed that you were okay and um, was being updated every 10, 15 minutes maximum at what was going on. Um, she was in bits and I felt so bad because she wasn't there and I just wanted to give her a big hug. Um, but yeah, that night uh, we couldn't really do much. It was just down to the doctors um, from when we got to the hospital. The only thing we could do was just sit with you and be there for you if you wanted to talk, which you didn't, and it was fine. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have said that um, I seemed more of a shell of a person than you were than you weren't yourself. just me you definitely weren't yourself it was like i don't know I, I i don't even know what way to explain it to be honest because obviously you're so bubbly and so talkative and you were just sitting there like with a blank facial expression and you you hardly said two words it was there was one time you popped a joke and that was it like for basically the whole time we were there you hardly said two words yeah and you Um, you stayed by my side that whole week um that i had got out of hospital um what was i like as a person that week that that sort of that that first week of recovery completely different to what you are even now to be honest um I was going, I, yeah, well, I live far away. Well, not far away, but half an hour from your house. I work in Bangor and Hollywood at the time. And I was going from work on my break to your house. So I was then going back to work. And then if I could, I was coming back to your house and seeing you in that week and just sitting with you and there being basically no conversation. It was just so weird. It was like you were a completely different person. But at the same time, I knew that if you wanted to talk or needed to talk, like you would. Yeah. Because, like, I can see it from a different point of view that's not a family point of view. For that, it's a very big thing when you're going through mental, um, like, mental battles we'll put it as like it's sometimes it's easier to talk to someone that's out of the family so knowing that I was just there like just sitting with you probably made you feel better but for me it was so weird because I wasn't used to it yeah but after after the first week and a half to two weeks um you started coming round again which was good um, you started eating again, you started going out again, like in the car and your anxiety levels in that first week were sky high. Um, you didn't want to leave the house. You didn't want to be around anybody you weren't close with. It was literally family and a couple of friends, if even a couple of friends. Yeah. It was not the Dylan any of us knew to be completely honest and it's something that you like you and I will be able to look back on and be like you got through that and for that like it's such a big thing yeah Yeah. my my first proper time out of the house um and my first time being within a big crowd since that was the day we went to the Christmas market. <laughs> um, uh, I was told by the doctor that I wasn't to drink and blah, blah, blah for that week that they were messing about with my medication and trying to get things right. Um, so when, I don't know, was it my idea or was it your idea just to go up to the market, I think? Well, I think it was more, we'll go for a drink. Yeah. yeah, and then it turned into okay, we're going to the Christmas market, and we're going to go to the beer tent. Yeah, and then it ended up a very good night, actually. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, like for that to be my first time out of the house since 
all that <clears throat> end of life attempt. Um, it was crazy, like for the Christmas market to be the first place. Um, but no, like the the whole week after the my attempt um, is it, is very much a blur to me. So it is, and I don't really understand it. Hence why I'm trying to piece together and see what it was like to be an outsider looking in. Um, but like, all I can say is thank you for helping me. You don't need to say thank you because I would like to, well, I know that if it had been the other way around, like you would have done the exact same. Like two years ago, I lost my granny and we weren't even very close. You were closer with um, another family member of mine. And it like even through that, you were there for my family. You came to my granny's funeral without even knowing my granny or knowing very much about the rest of my family and for that I will be thankful so it, like Dylan you don't understand that I wouldn't do anything you wouldn't no yeah I don't know it's so it's so hard to explain like you know what I mean like <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like anything anything I would do you would do 10 times more is what I'm trying to say yeah like you put yourself out there for people you put your head in the line for people and if they don't return that favor willingly and without any like without and without wanting any thanks or praise or anything then people like that just that you you don't need people like that and for me to be able to say that I was part of the rock that got you back on your feet it's it's unbelievable because there was a stage that some of us never thought you would actually get back to being yourself and here you are a few months down the line doing doing amazing (laughs) yeah yeah and there's going to be people out there that will watch this and they will be friends of someone who may need help. From your perspective, any advice for people that may need or may need that extra help uh, as a friend to give to someone else, what would you advise? Um, just be there unconditionally, um, no matter what time of day, night, whatever if you know you're in that very vulnerable space you need to be able to drop everything at the the drop of a hat and be there for them it's a lot easier said than done don't get me wrong but it is so worth it to be able to look back on it and say that you still have that friend in the present day that you may not have had six months ago so be there for them and if you yourself then start feeling vulnerable or feeling down make sure you also have someone to lean on as well like a family member or another friend because that can also be um very good help like if it wasn't the night uh, the 18th of november if i hadn't have had dana there to support me i probably wouldn't have been able to support you as much as i did yeah and for that i'm thankful for dana as well because she is she held me up that night because it was honestly the scariest night of my life so far. So make sure you have a support system or someone that you can turn to if you need to as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, honey, for speaking to me. I know it's late where you are, um, but I will let you get. I let you get your bed, and I will give you a shout uh, tomorrow. So I will. No problem, darling. It was lovely talking to you. Yes. And I hope that uh, filming goes well for you. Thank you. <laughs> and I hope you come home soon. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. 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 Dead on. <laughs> well, Lauren, thank you very much, honey. I appreciate Every it. Every conversation we'll have another day. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to thank me. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, honey. I will speak later. Okay. See you later. Bye. Love you. Bye. Wrap. Yeah, I like that. Dead on.
Yeah, yeah. How does it feel for you knowing that one of the people there that was there that night is now on the other side of the world? Um, it, it, it's scary. So it is because she's the first person that I wanted to make contact with. It's the first person that I can vaguely remember the police asking, is there anyone you want me to phone? Um, and we just, Lauren, and, and now, yes, she's always there at the end of the phone, but physically, no, she's not. It's different. It, it's, it's very different. It's a, it, I would love to say it's the same friendship. It's not, it's a different friendship, but still as strong. Um, but like, I mean, if everyone had a friend like Lauren, you'd, you'd be loving life like. It's brilliant, so it is. Um, well, I was about little, just about to make a cup of tea and I got a phone call from my oldest son, D Daniel. And he asked, he asked me, um, do I know where Dylan is? And I says, no, I haven't seen him in a couple of days. And why, well, what's wrong? And uh, he says, he's done something stupid, Dad. Which I said, what has he done? And he says, Dad, look, I don't know how to tell you, but he's taken overdose. I hear me right. Well, if I see him, I will let you know. But then as five, ten minutes went by, I said to his stepmom, listen, we're going to have to jump into the car here and we're going to have to go and find him. But the only two places I could think of where he could be was his stepdad's or yeah. Jeff's grave. And uh, so on the way to Bangor, I actually phoned one of Dylan's friends and asked him where could you look in these two places and sort of see if he's there. And then I got a phone call back and said, we'll find his car. And I said, right, well, then he's at Jeff's grave then. So go to Jeff's grave and try and find him. And there you were at Jeff's grave. Well, you actually weren't at Jeff's grave. You were on your way to the hospital, which I flew to the hospital, got into the reception, and there you were. You looked like death's door to me, which was nice to see <laughs> my middle son doing this. Why could he not come and talk to me? You know, so I actually did hug him and then I said, turned around and said to him, talk to me and your dad, come up and see me. Yeah. And uh, he says, Dad, I don't want to be here. Which is hurtful to a parent. But I've been told by people that I was merely just a shell of a person. You were. So I was. Basically um, just a shell. There was no life in you. No. Um, with with all that going on, you I can remember you staying in Mum's house that night until Daniel got down the next morning. Yes, that's right. So some people just telling me some bits and bobs. Um, when I got let out of the hospital, what was I like as a person still? You were still a shell, but... You were sort of, whenever I said to you, and I said to the consultant who was looking after you, you can either stay here in the hospital. This is what the consultant turned around and told me, that you can stay in the hospital and come your tablet system out of you, or else go home, but you have to have a responsible adult with you, yeah. which one of your friends, I don't know, Lauren, can't, Lauren yeah. She turned around and says, I can stay, but I'm only stay for a while. Because, you know, work in, the work in the morning. And I says, look, don't worry about it. I will stay with him. Uh -huh. And I will be there if he's... Hopefully, I was hoping you were going to be sick. To get them all out. To get it out of your system. But you were just talking a wee bit of nonsense to me. And I said, Dylan, look, go to bed. And I'll be downstairs if you need me. 
So you went to bed and you had a few hours sleep, which you kept checking on you. And but you were still like before you even went to bed you were still a shell. Yeah. The next day, um I had an appointment with a mental health specialist. Um and you came to that appointment. I'm still trying to piece together what it was like as a person, uh, in the week after. The week after I let let out of the hospital and uh, that week they were trying to uh, fix my tablets and yes. get me on stronger dosages and stuff like that there. Um, what was I like as a person that week also? You were, it's, it's, I'm, as you know, I'm your dad, but I'm a jokey sort of a person. Yeah. You know, I was still trying to banter with you, you know, to try and bring you around to, to see that there is people here for you, you know. There's me, there's your mum, there's your brothers, you know, your friends, there's, you know, there's numbers of people here who love you and want you to stay on the earth. Yeah. You know, but yeah, we went to the doctors in Yetnards, mental health, and we went in first, and the, obviously to talk to you, and then me and your mum followed behind soon after. Yeah. Um with that there, um, did you notice any warning signs within me that stuff like this was going to happen? No. There was nothing? There was nothing. Because um, uh, as a father, it's been through this um, with one of their kids, being me, uh, suicide attempt, and it's come out the other side with the lucky one. Um, is there any advice you would give any parents out there that are maybe going through this themselves with one of their kids? Look for signs. Always look for signs and for actual, you know, I can't give enough advice, you know, I knew nothing about it, you know, I do mental health, I, I'm sort of, I don't really know much about it, but when it happens to one of your sons, you surely, don't know what I'm allowed to say, but you surely get a good kick up the arse and you surely know that you need to be aware of the signs. Um, and any young people out there as a parent, do you have any advice for them? Um, if they are thinking about doing something or life's getting too hard or life's getting too tough with them, what is your advice? If Even if you can't go and talk to your parents, you know, go and talk to somebody. Even, like, you know, a stranger, is, uh, anybody, anybody you can find, just talk. Do you think it's brought us closer? Yes. As father and son? I do indeed, yes. I always, I always text you more now than I ever did to find out how are you. Even doing this documentary, you know, worries me a bit that that cause it's all about suicide and stuff like that. You know, I even text you now more, is, how you doing, what about you? Yeah. Do you understand mental health and suicide more now than what you ever did or do you still think you could learn some more things? I could actually learn more things but I'm more aware of it now. You're more aware of the signs? Yeah, You're more what I'm looking out for, what I'm, you know, if I don't get a text back or if I get a, a nonsense text back from you, I know you're alright. <laughs> but if I get a text saying, Dad, because you call me Jason. Jay. Jay. But if I get a text saying, Dad, uh -huh. I know there's something. Yeah. Um, if, in a few words, just a few words, someone's watching this, what do you advise them to do? Don't be stupid, just go and talk. Think what you're going to do and if, if it gets too much, you know, again, if somebody's out walking, even like walking a dog or, and you see them and you're thinking about doing this, just say that to them. Look, I'm not in a good place. Could you get somebody for me or, you know, don't hide away. Do not hide away. It's happened. Don't hide. Thank you. The bond between me and my dad is huge. And since my suicide attempt, it's gotten incredibly closer. The one thing I've never seen is my dad cry. And it did pull my heartstrings. It was tough knowing that I put my family through this but it's taught me that I have an amazing circle around me.
everybody, meet Brian. I got him Christmas Eve 2018. At this point, I couldn't interview Brian. But I've had him for two years now, and he's a massive help, mentally and emotionally, and even physically. Just when I thought I rescued him, the tables turned, and it turns out, he rescued me. Shortly after I got Brian registered as an ESA, that stands for Emotional Support Animal. Brian knows when I'm feeling down and is able to pick me up and take my mind off the current thoughts and divert them towards him. A bit like an attention seeker, but a supportive one. In my suicide attempt, I was lucky because I got help from the support that is out there. And now, I want to show you. So the Tommy team are down here at St. Patrick's Church to help with the Outreach Soup Kitchen, uh, providing food parcels to the homeless and the needy during these uncertain times. Let's go ahead and chat to Megan and the team and find out a bit more in depth on what Tommy do and speak to Mick, because Mick was one of the first responders in my recovery. I'm gonna get some free food also. And one more. Is there a flyer, is there? <laughs> <laughs> the 18th of November, I took an overdose. A couple of days after you spoke to my brother yep. about this. Um, no, I don't remember anything. I'm trying, to piece, I'm trying to piece together what actually happened that night and the days after. I want to know what happened um, when you spoke to my brother. Did you give him advice? Did you give what, 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 sort of what was said? Right, so I can remember that I felt that in my gut that there was something up with you. And I, I kept, there was a few things coming up and I really wanted, as with the youth, the youth really loved having you about them. You just had that aura of just happiness and just joy. So they, they wanted it about, but I just had this gut feeling. Dylan's not himself. He hasn't been on social media, he hasn't been thing. So I was texting you constantly and I got a call from your brother mm. and I said, Mickey, I was like, Dylan? <laughs> no, I was like, you yeah. sound a bit different. And he was like, Mick, this is uh, Dylan's brother. So it was a bit taken back straight away, red flag. I was like, something's up. Yeah. I said, where's Dylan, is he okay? And I said, yeah, uh, he doesn't want to take any calls. So I was like, right, no problem. Uh, could, you, could you let him know? And he said, look, Mickey, He's talked to me a few times about you and then he tried to take his own life. So I was like, oh, see when I say my heart sank. As you know, I've, I've lost my uncle to suicide and I was like, oh my God, a friend. So uh, he basically asked for a bit of advice and said, look, what way could we go about things? What way? Thing? And I just, I told him, just as long as you make sure that yourself and the whole family's around him constantly to let him know that, okay, he, he, he's one of the lucky ones that are still here and we'll get the ball rolling after, uh, just to make sure what steps of your recovery. And that's what it is, you're, just, you're, you're in recovery stage now where you can see every day that it's not the way to go. And I mean, us at Tommy, we are excited and ecstatic that it didn't go as far as it could have went. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the work that Tommy does on a day-to-day -day basis, like we're here down at the soup kitchen, um, the, the team of volunteers here, um, but outside of this sort of work, the mental health basis and stuff, um, for people who don't understand, don't know what Tommy does, what, what, what is it that you guys do? Well, so Tommy stands for Tackling Awareness of Mental Health Issues. Uh, it was set up in 2011, where a spate of suicides in the local area. It was set up by Joseph Donnelly. And what he done was he set up this organisation to work with sports clubs. And with the sports clubs, he was giving out resources and numbers to local other charities, which sort of were able to help and give guidance to recovery. So it, it, I got on board as well with Joe a few years later. And uh, basically me and him are yin and yang. And it just boomed. We decided to broaden our sports clubs bigger, uh, go into youth clubs, and now we're in every single school in Belfast. 
So we've been in, uh, we do mental health games, which you have taken part in oh, yourself. Uh, some yeah. are good, some so, are I mean, it is, it's, it's, a, it's an innovative way of actually learning mental health. Instead of going into your classroom based and talking, oh, X, Y, and Z, the kids are just going to be like, are you playing the PlayStation later? And you'll lose your attention. Where if you get it in thermatic play, where you can actually play, have fun, and then learn about mental health and how you're able to combat that, then you're on the winner. And that's yeah. exactly what we've done. Yeah, the, the, the few, few bits and bobs that I've been involved in, um, and, and outstanding, like, um, for someone who is watching and may be going through something, we'll tackle the, the person that may be going through something first. What advice, as Tammy, as the charity organisation and as Mickey, what advice do you give to that person if they're going through something that they think is, it's unbearable to go through anymore? The main advice is to see how you're feeling. It won't last. It really won't last and to talk to someone, anyone, anyone that you, you don't have to even trust them fully. You can talk to your next door neighbor, absolute anyone. You are more special than you'll ever know. And if you seek the help, I promise it, sir. There's a lot of people that have a sense of hopelessness that think there is nothing out there. You know yourself, there's tons out there. It's the backstreet organizations, the, the, the ones that aren't government funded and self funded they're the ones that step in a lot quicker because the likes of yourself helped and then my, uh, my counselling sessions with suicide awareness over in the falls they uh, i i know as soon as i came out of that first counselling session i felt like a breath of fresh air something just like a weight's been lifted off uh, yeah. something uh, that just <laughs> happened but a lot of people i see that one person that needs that help hearing you say that they will go i want to feel like that but until they actually open up and explain the hard air feeling and why, they, they might know why they're feeling it, but I promise there's others that will have the answers for them and bring them back yeah. to normal. As a friend group then, uh, you've got a friend group, and there's one person in that friend group that's not feeling right. The friend group don't know how to handle it. Advice. Right. So the, the, for a friendship group, it's the same with my Ray group. If one of them aren't feeling the best, they will go in and make sure they're together as a unit. Uh, we have spoke about that friendship group and as well I said, I'll come down and we'll do yeah. the games or anything with them. It's, but most importantly, it's for users as a unit to make them make him know that no matter what time or day, you are there for. Yeah. A lot of people, the brain can be your worst enemy your mind, it'll tell you that you're alone and it'll also pass on some weird, awkward thoughts. Yeah. It's for you to just constantly go, I've got you, is everything okay? Yeah. Sometimes is a wee, is everything okay? You're looking well today, goes a long way. Well, you're looking well today too. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mickey, thank you very much for having me involved with Tammy over the last couple of years. The work that you guys do is phenomenal and if I can pay anything back to you, I will. Um, you did, you paid us back, you're okay now, yeah. and you're getting there. And yeah. I, I, honestly, it may sound like a cliche, I promise you that's all the payment we need, but yeah. and I mean that, that's not, that's not being, being cheesy and thing. As yeah. long as you're okay, that's what we want. We, we're not looking, see all the... All the money in the world. We're not looking to become millionaires. We're just looking to help and save. Yeah. Save just even one person's life. No, we 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 kind of took a break from all this COVID stuff, but uh, we would rather be down here helping homeless people and helping people in need and stuff like that. That's all it's about. But in my counselling sessions, I was always taught to take five. Take five of anything, and I regularly do this now because it gives me a chance to clear my head and start again. There's nothing better than getting five minutes to just be with yourself. I think now is the time I should revisit where this all started.
Last time I left these gates was about quarter past 12 on the 18th or on the 19th morning. I was uh, brought out of here with the police to be escorted to the hospital. Immediately, as soon as I walk through these gates, I get like a sense of relief. So I do. One of those feelings where you're just like, life's problems have been left at that, those gates because my best mate lies here and he sort of protects me as such. So yeah, it was here. I had about four boxes of tablets lying, about, lying out. I was just going through one by one, strip by strip, as I was talking away to Geoffrey. Um, and problems were ending slowly but surely. So they were, and life for me at that moment of time was getting increasingly better because I was starting to get very drowsy and get very not with it as such the words the word would be that the the tablets were starting then to take control and yeah lay here and next thing I know I wake up in the hospital seeking help and I'm grateful for that help at the time it was not at the time I was just I want to do this, I need to do this, it has to be done. And now I'm grateful for all this happening. I'm grateful for the help I received because now through this documentary and th through the help I do every day, I can give back what, I was, what was given to me and I can, I've lived that life. I've lived that life where I didn't want to be here anymore. And now it's time for me to teach people that those thoughts are, are time or only a moment, matter of time before those thoughts then disappear and you, you become more with it as such. You, you start acting upon things and you start wanting to get yourself better. Yeah. Um, this is your first time back, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's the first time being here since that night. Um, and I, I, I've shied away from coming here because I knew that I would feel like this, but I know now, after being here now, I can just come here again and I can sit and I can chat away to my heart's content. How are you feeling? Um, <laughs> now it's like general flashbacks of that night, night of blue lights coming up here. Um, just at the corner of my eye, you get those blue lights coming up, so you do. and. You just get those flashbacks of the police coming in through those gates and calling to me and coming up to me and shaking me, making sure I was still breathing. Luckily I was. The fat tablets didn't take full effect as of yet. So it was just it was a time game really from then to me getting up to the hospital, to me getting my treatment. And then basically the way I've the way I would word it for me is I got a second chance of life. I tried to take my own, my first chance of life away. So now I'm on my second chance and I'm gonna boss this chance. So I am because like any day I was feeling down and I went and seen Jeff, he just turned around to me and says, mate, it is what it is, but at the end of the day, don't be doing anything stupid because it's not worth it. And at the time when I was sitting here, taking those pills, I heard his voice saying this to me, but I kept on going, I kept on taking, open another packet, another strip, down the hatch where they went. Um, and it was just, it was a feeling that when I was sitting here, I knew that it was only a matter of hours before I would see him again. Um, 
and that was what's, what was dragging me towards doing it because I wanted to see him again um, because all the problems that I had in my head no one could fix and I knew well, there was only one person that could help me and that was Jeff and Jeff helped me through every problem like he stopped me from taking my life one time before so he did where I left his house and he uh, called me back and I, I, I think in his own head he knew what I was going to do he got a gut instinct and that's why he called me back and there was no reason for him to call me back he didn't need me he told me he needed me but when I went back he didn't um, and we just sat and chatted so we did and we sat and talked and that's that's just how special he was to me um, and you, you don't get those those friends as much I've got a huge friend circle but there's only those certain people you would stand you would you would let all your problems out to so there is and I only knew Jeff nine months and we were really close um, I went in and looked after him so I did and we became really good friends and from there he helped me sort of shape my life but then when he, he unfortunately passed away with his battle of M&D um, my battle then started again and I went off the rails like I was taking drugs and I was doing everything I shouldn't have been doing because I was hurt because the problem, my problems were coming back because there was no one to help me deal with my problems I didn't realise that there was the organisations that there is now to help and if I had a knew those organisations were there I probably still wouldn't have went because there was only one person in my head I wanted to talk to and I couldn't that's why I come here and I have my safe place but there was just that night that I had my bag I had like most people who are ex experiencing suicidal thoughts will have everything ready for when the cup overflows they'll lift what they need to lift and they'll, they'll go and do it there's nothing worse than having that in your head and being that person and having that thought being I'm going to do this no one is going to stop me I left my house came down here I was driving in tears listening to music just like listening to songs that I thought I'm, this is going to be the last time I hear this song. This is going to be the last time I drive my car here. Like, it didn't phase me, like, how I was getting my car home. My car is sentimental to me because Jeffrey helped me buy that car. He helped me pick it, so he did. And yeah, he had a massive influence in my life the nine months that I knew him. And I felt like I knew him longer than what I actually did because we got on so well. But, like, yeah, he's a missed man, not just by me, by family, by friends, by his two kids, by his nephews, by his nieces. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say to Jeffrey whilst you're here? How long have you got? <laughs> it's one of these things where everything you say you say it, it comes straight from the heart, like the only thing you could, I could really say right now to Jeffrey is thank you because I think it was him that that night made everything go the way it has, had went. So it did, it was him that got the help here. Like, people watching this mightn't, mightn't believe in spirits and this, that and the other and guardian angels but I know I've got him as a guardian angel and he is one of the reasons why I got a second chance of life. Do you want us to give you a minute with him? The, uh, before, before you do, the believe, the bottom of the headstone is what he had tattooed onto his arm. That was, when he was driving the cars and stuff, he always seen it. So he did, and he always believed. And that's what I always do. I always believe that life will get better because it does, so it does. It's, it's one of those things where 
bad thoughts only last moments. Life lasts forever. You know, if you if there's people out there that are struggling, go to your safe place. Take a minute. Talk to talk to whoever you need to talk to because there is people that are listening. Um, but yeah, very missed man. One of those things, you know. So I take it radios your sort of release, your getaway? Yeah. Oh yeah, big time. But I have to be in the mood. I have to be in the mood. What, I can come in here and sit in here and work on shit. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not in the mood, I'll sit in here and sit on my phone. And not do anything. If you weren't in the mood, how would you get yourself in the, in the mood? Listen to air checks online. Go onto YouTube, listen to air checks. Listen to people doing radio, get ideas. And be like, fuck, I want to try that. It's Belfast Dance Music Factory with Dylan in the evening. We're playing tunes right through until 10 tonight. Hopefully you're well. Um, I've had a, a glorious couple of weeks off, so I have. I'm not gonna, like, not gonna rub it in too much because there is people that have actually had to go back to work, which is sign of the times and sign that things are getting a wee bit better, which is fantastic. So do you think doing radio on quarantine's made it easier or harder? It's more to talk about. More to talk about? Yeah. Generally, just more to talk about. It's like, what, what, what are you people getting up to when they're in the house? Uh, anyone got anything different they're doing? My recovery journey is ongoing, and it will forever be ongoing. Yes, I still have my down days, and so does everyone. But now, I know how to cope with them, and I know how to turn a down day back right side up. I've got an amazing and very supportive friend group. As you've seen, I've got an amazing and very supportive family. And my job is insane. I get lost in music. And that is my pure happy place. Though there is one place I want us to go to. Cave Hill, one of the most iconic places in Belfast and a place where you can see across the whole city but it's also a place that claims a lot of lives male and female 307 registered deaths and they were all suicide in 2018 it's crazy and to think behind me as you can see the view there is someone right now, this very minute, contemplating suicide. They can't cope with their emotions, they can't cope with their feelings, and they don't know how to talk. You see, your way out of suicide 
is to open up and talk about it. Get stuff off of your, off your head. Open up, speak to someone. I don't know who you would rather speak to. The people of Belfast are the most friendliest people in the world. Go and talk to a stranger. No one's going to turn you away and say, leave me alone. If anything, someone's going to direct you to somewhere to get that help. When I walked into Cave Hill this morning, you hit, you hit with overwhelming emotions. You feel fear as you walk up here because the amount of people that have come here with the intentions of ending their own life. It's crazy. I generally think that we, as the general public now, need to take a stand and need to fight to erase the stigma surrounding because too many people think that they can't speak out because it doesn't make them a man or they can't speak out because they're stronger than that. Trust me, speaking out proves that you're a man, proves that you're strong because you want another go at this, this whole life thing. And if I could just get through to one person who's watching this right now and just tell them, I survived suicide, so can you. If you have been affected by Dylan's story, there are organisations that can help. Should you require more information, please visit suicideandme.com.